So it's a whole lot easier to just stop and restart the recording. Okay, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to what is supposed to be lesson 15 of uh, Engineering 1330. We're going to continue with hypothesis testing. And if you read your email earlier this morning, I was struggling with trying <laughs> to uh, regain control of the content server. At the same time, the scripting cells stopped working. And I don't have them working yet, but uh, I decided this would be a, a good day to demonstrate some of the things you will have to do in your future to attempt to debug your scripts and figure out what's broken. I don't understand what RIP means either in, in the context of, uh, of this class. So let me turn on. Okay, so I've got, I've got the recorder going. I'm going to share my screen, press the share button, delete that, stick the chat box where I can see it. And I am working directly on the content server with lesson 16. So this is what we're supposed to have today. It's hypothesis testing continued. I never got around to completing <clears throat> the objectives because as I started working down through the uh, file, it, it stopped doing something. So let me show you what it's supposed to do. So I, I would talk about Mendel's P flowers and we'll still do that. And it gets down here and you start making histograms. And then we have the ability to put values onto the histogram. It would be nice if it would still do that. And as of right now, but maybe maybe with you all watching, it does it doesn't work. So this is supposed to be the necessary environment. And we also introduce uh, the the supporting tool that goes with this textbook, inferential thinking. Um, there is a tool called data science. But if you just attempt to import data science, you will probably get an error. You actually have to install it onto your local machine using pip or conda. So this is uh, my install um, script for my machine. Yours will be something different. If you're using Conda, uh, just attempt first attempt Conda install data science. When that fails, then do um, uh, pip install data science. Okay, so here I have it and I get I get no um, no no criticism. It seems to have installed. And then we we'll go down here, run that, that works fine. So far, there's nothing funny. Here's our first use of data science. So let's see if that does anything. Right now, we're getting proportions of three, which makes absolutely no sense. They should be less than one. I'll run my simulated distance script. That looks like that worked. It produced 10,000 distances. If we go ahead and interrogate one, Somebody pick a number between one and 10,000. 132. 132, okay, 1032. Sure enough, there is a number there. And I'm gonna skip this for the time being. This is supposed to produce that histogram. And when I run it, nothing. Okay, so this is a good example of how to start to deep. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know why it won't draw a picture. I go to a different computer and I get the same failure to draw a picture. I won't, I won't walk you through that. So I, um, I'll just go run that and same failure to draw a picture. And so now that's odd. So now we have something that is an important part of engineering problem solving is our computer used to work and now it doesn't. So 
your options are somewhat limited in that situation. You can attempt to stuff your credit card into the um, CD-ROM slot and maybe it'll read it. Uh, you can take it to a computer repair place and they're gonna laugh at you because it's like, oh, that's a software problem. Um, that's not our problem. Um, we're using free software, so there's nobody we can call that will actually give us an answer. We are now having to uh, debug it ourselves. So um, let's put through a pro thought process of what, what can go wrong. First, we establish our problem statement, which is it's not plotting a histogram. So the next question we have to ask in debugging, is that because the plotting subsystem is broken or is something else broken? So let's go to Matt Plot Library, and uh, here is an example, and this looks like it's a fully contained example. So I should be able to copy and paste this code into my notebook and get this output. So let me go ahead and try that. So I'm grabbing everything, hit copy, go over here to the correct Jupyter Lab, hit paste and it's importing all the stuff it needs. It makes some numbers. We've done this earlier in this class. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Farhang has taken some of his examples possibly from the same place. So we should get that plot, um, something in black and something in green. So we'll run that and now there's nothing. So that's somewhat disturbing because it's like, oh, is my plot subsystem broken? My computer's actually done this before. Yeah, they, they do that, but this is a good example of a, a debugging thing. Yeah, it's very frustrating. So I'm gonna go and create a new launcher, make an empty Python 38 notebook and find out if it's something to do with that particular notebook or if it has to do with my computer subsystem. So I've just copied the same thing in. So if the subsystem has failed, I've, I've got a lot of worries. And sure enough, okay, so that showed the plot. Okay, so my computer can make plots. It's something to do with my lesson 16 notebook. And the only thing odd in lesson 16 notebook is this data science package. So let me suppress that save the notebook real quick. And I'm going to introduce a command that's rather dangerous, but um, we can use it when we have to. This is called the reset command. And uh, what it's gonna do is wipe all the variables out of our notebook. And it gives you a warning when we run it. it says once deleted, it can't recover variables. So I'm gonna go ahead and select yes. And, and now, there's nothing in the, in the system memory stack. And I'm gonna go through one cell at a time. And notice here, data science has been suppressed. So I will run that. And then I'm gonna skip all the way down to the plot. And let's see if that will generate a plot. Still is refusing. So there is something broken at this notebook and it has to do with the data science subsystem. Um, and it would, it's probably gonna take me another couple hours to uh, figure out what, what got broken. Um, another option I have is to exit everything entirely. So I will try that next. Fortunately, I have the HTMLs on what it's supposed to look like, and I can complete today's lesson from that. Okay, so everything is exited. File, log out. And actually, I will close everything. And let me try to get back in again.
So we have logged back in. And so in theory, um, none of this stuff should be available. Let's check that out. I'll do this one because nothing's loaded. I should get an error message. God, that's weird. That should not work like that. I'm going to reboot the uh, computer. Okay, cool. It's rebooting. And if that doesn't work, well, then we're sunk. And I'll, I'll go ahead and complete the, um, the uh, lesson from the HTML file. So this is likely to happen to you at some point in your future. Maybe not today, maybe not next week, maybe not in a year or two, but eventually everything you do is, is going to break. And the algorithms that we've been doing to do computery stuff are just as appropriate for how to um, how to try to diagnose what's broken and make a repair. Um, every time I use something from UC Berkeley, this happens. I can get it working and it works for a few weeks and then it breaks. And rather than um, make terrible aspersions since I am being recorded, um, there's a certain amount of arrogance in the packages that distribute. And if you don't have the secret agent decoder ring, sometimes you are you are um, your host. Okay, so I, I, I just rebooted and I think I can reconnect directly without having to do password exchanges. Very cool. And, and that's a true reboot because it actually took me somewhere else. So we'll go back to our lesson, which is 16. 16 is 15, that's right. So there's the program that's supposed to run. And let's, um, again, uh, I will skip the import data science and go straight to the plot and see if I can get it to plot a function. And it is taking an inordinately long time to make the connection. Okay, so you all watch that. We just plotted a function, we just plotted a histogram. So as far as we can tell, this notebook currently is capable of making histogram plots. Now let's go break everything. And here I am actually really leveraging the way these notebooks work. Um, let me go look at the cell. So this, this one with a square bracket means that this was the first computational cell that I ran. And there's the output. Now the second cell I'm going to run, I'm going to go ahead and load in if I can find it, I'm going to load in data science. I don't think I need NumPy anymore. And I think I've already loaded in the map plot library. So I'll go ahead and suppress those for this debugging exercise. I'm going to import the data science module. And it claims it succeeded. And now we will talk about Mendel's flowers. So Gregor Mendel, as you may know, was an Austrian monk who was right, widely recognized as the founder of the modern field of genetics. And because of him, we have Moderna and AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, um, messenger RNA uh, virus vaccines. He performed careful and large scale experiments on plants to come up with what are known as the fundamental laws of genetics. And he spent a lot of his time on pea plants. I imagine because they were cheap, and he was hoping he was going to get the one that was going to go up to the cloud so he'd get the goose with the golden egg. And he formulated sets of assumptions about each variety, and those became his, his data models. And then he tested his models by growing plants and gathering data. 
So um, we're going to use Mendel's model from one such experiment as a way to see how effective his data model of plant behavior is um, and help us uh, understand another use of hypothesis testing. In one particular set of plants, he was able to get either purple flowers or white flowers. And he never had any plants die because all this stuff added up to 100%. So that, that's amazing, a green thumb. And the color of each plant is unaffected by the colors in the other plants. And he hypothesized that the plants should bear purple or white flowers at random in the ratio of three to one. So there's a 75% chance in any given plant that it will produce a purple flower and a 25% chance in any given plant that it'll make a white flower. And so to go about assessing his model, we can simulate the plants under the assumptions of the model and see what it predicts. And then we can compare the predictions with the actual data that Mendel recorded, which is called the statistic. Um, our goal is to see whether or not Mendel's model is good and we need to simulate a statistic that will help us make this decision. If the model's good, the percent of purple flowering plants in the sample should be close to 75%. If the model's crummy, the percent of purple flowering plants will be far away from 75%. And we've already explored the near and the far with the set one and the set two histograms. So set one and set two, are they, I'm, I'm testing your medium term memory. So this is from two days ago and five days ago, uh, seven days ago. Is your set one and set two, would you say those sets are close to one another on the number line or far apart? Far apart. Good, you are correct. So one of the metrics we could have used on those is the, is the distance between the mean value of the two sets. Actually, I think we did that in hypothesis testing. Uh, so if we were going to assert that set two is a good model set one, that's a crummy assertion. Our statistic, which is the distance between means is, is too big. Uh, the same way we're going to play this game with, um, with um, plants. If we take the sample percent of purple um, of the flowering plants, minus 75%, which is what we expect it to be, that distance um, is our statistic or our measure of how good or crummy our model is. So to see how big the distance would be if Mendel's model were true, we'll use sample proportions to simulate the distance under the assumptions of the model. So first we have to figure out how many times the sample, we already know it's gonna be a lot, and to do this, remember, we're going to compare it to the actual data. So we should simulate the same number of plants he had. Mendel grew a lot of plants. I mean, he was working at an, at an, Aust at an, at an Austrian monastery. Um, buildings in Austria aren't exactly big. And if it's a monastery, they don't have any money. So they're using real small buildings. He grew 929 plants in one of his experiments. And so we'll sample 929 values. And so here's the simulation we'll play. We're going to do 929 random samples from the distribution specified by the model. So we have a data model already. Our data model is that a plant will produce a purple flower 75% of the time and a white flower 25% of the time. So we can, we can simulate as many plants as we want um, and we'll do that 929 times. And then we're going to compare the results of our data model to the actual observations. And then we'll assess whether the model did a good job or a crummy job. So we're going to create a function called distance from 75. It's not a very elegant function. In fact, the name is longer than the function. And we're going to take 100 times the proportion uh, P and from that we'll subtract 75 and that's going to give us the distance of the proportion 
uh, from 75. So if P happens to be 0 0.75, 100 times 0.75 is um, 75, and 75 minus 75 is zero. That would be a really ideal um, metric. And as the distances get bigger, we will argue that the model is crummier. So that function is defined. And then we're going to create what kind of Python object is model underscore proportions? Is it a ding dong? Or a tuple? Or an integer? Or an array? Oh, you're all asleep. Well, I is think it's a list. I think it's a list with two items in it. Very good. So we have this list, and we're going to have a proportion of purple in a sample is um, equal to this data science object called sample proportions. And to understand what sample proportions is supposed to do, we have to go read the textbook. You know, that's the thing that nobody's ever read. Um, and as we work our way, we'll skip the jury selection. We want to go to Mendel's pea flowers. So this is the example that I, I am trying to use. And so they describe what the sample proportion is supposed to do. And the result of, of, of that code cell is going to be the, the distance of our statistic from a single sample. Let me get back to where we're supposed to be. There we go. So I'll go ahead and run that. And the model proportions are going to be 0.75 purple, 0.25 white. It's going to return a value of either purple or white. It's going to do that 929 times. And then we're going to keep track of the distance from 75 for the proportion of purple in the sample. So we do that and we get an error message. Let me fix that. Proportion of purple. So it says, at least in this instance, our 929 samples, the number of purples is 3.36 units away from 75%. So that's one simulated value of the distance. And then we'll do this many, many times. We're going to do it 10,000 times to simulate our, um, to simulate what the population behavior would be. Okay, here goes nothing. And I'm going to run distances. And for example, distance 1032, that was somebody's favorite number of the alphabet. We'll do 999, which is 666 upside down. So that there's, there's the result of 10,000 simulations. And we can convince ourselves that we are actually getting 10,000 things back. So the, the list distances, the array distances has 10,000 things in it. And now the part that I wanted to do, which was to make a histogram. There is a function in the data science module that, that says uh, we can take a table that has a column. We can name, name the column distance between sample and 75%. We can take the object distances and produce a histogram. So that's supposed to produce a histogram. Here goes nothing. With any luck, it'll fail, which means we go to the HTML version and the lecture gets way shorter. So everybody got their fingers crossed that this will fail. Sweet, I got my histograms back. Okay, this turned out to be a great lesson. You get to see me debug it and we're now getting what I wanted. So there's the histogram of our 10,000 simulations of Mendel's experiment. 
he only got to do one. We get to do 10,000 because we're doing it in a, in a fake computer world, um, you know, World of Warcraft and stuff. Um, so we have roughly 60% of the distances are between zero and one half. Um, 40 ish between one half and one and in declining as, as we, as we move far away. So we have very few observations where the distance between the sample percentile and our model percentile is bigger than five. So if we examine the horizontal axis to see the typical values of distances predicted by the model, they're pretty small. A high proportion of the distances are in the range zero to one, meaning that for a high proportion of the samples, the percent of purple flowering plants is within 1% to 75%. That is the sample percentage is in the range 74% to 76%. Our next desirable step is to compare the prediction and the data. So to assess the model, we have to compare the prediction with the data. Mendel recorded the number of purple and white flowering plants among 929 plants that he grew. 705 were purple. That's about 75.89%. So we're going to con convert um, the 705 of the 929. We're going to round it to four decimal places, multiply by 100 to a express the percentile in a, in a whole number. There's no reason why we couldn't use 0 0.7589 except that the other part of our script has already multiplied everything by 100. So this is an actual experiment using real plants um, and we get a real number. And so the observed value of our testing statistic which we already decided was the distance between the sample percentile and 75. 75 is our data model, is 0 0.89 units. So 0.89% is the distance in our actual observations from our model. Now, without much further uh, work is, is less than 1%, close enough in, in, in instances that you are intuitively familiar with. It is 0.89%, is that a good, it, does that mean that our model is a good descriptor of our experiment or a bad descriptor? Pretty good for PFARs. I'm just asking for an opinion here. There's, there's no right answer and no wrong answer. Looks good to me. Yeah, 1% is, is pretty darn close when we're looking at 929 things. So our intuition would be that um, Mendel's uh, model is pretty good, or he cooked the books, but our intuition would be that they're pretty good. So we'll go ahead and we'll compute that. And so if we go back here in our, in our simulated distribution of the population, so this is a pseudo God result, 0 0.89 is, is right about there. So we're eyeballing, uh, fitting in. Let me put, hold the cursor. That's about where 0 0.89 is. And, and so we'd say, yeah, that's, that's, that's awful close to the big part of our distribution. We'd be happy with that. Uh, we can have more fun. Hopefully this will work. I'm now going to attempt to take that histogram that you just saw and I'm and on top of it, I'm going to overlay the position of the observed, observed statistic. And we should get a red, we'll get half of a red dot at 0.89%, at or we'll get nothing. There's our red dot there. It's barely visible. Let's go ahead and crank up its size. Hopefully S is the size of parameter. This thing is demanding that I, I'll get my kicks on route 66. Okay, so there's our red dot. And so our, our, our test statistic, which is the red dot, 
relative to our data model, which is the gray histogram, is pretty good. A perfect test statistic would, would, would produce it down by zero. And, and that is helping me introduce the elements of, of a statistical test. Now this is coming from a statistics book. So this is the way statistical tests are normally, are normally taught. Probably within the next five minutes, I should have you all thoroughly confused, which is of course my goal. But let's review our statistical test uh, from last time, as well as from the picture here. Because what we're trying to do is decide if our red dot is close enough to the expected behavior of the population or if the red dot is way out here. Um, actually, let's go ahead and play with that for a second. I'm gonna change the plot. If, if that was our result, if that was our observation red dot in the gray histogram is what our model says things should be, would we conclude that the experiment came from that population or not? Is our model a good explanation of the red dot? Yes or no question? No. No, that looks pretty bad. No. Yeah, that looks pretty bad. If the red dot moves there, we would probably still say, yeah, it's, I'm not too comfy with that. Red dot moves there. Oh, I'm getting really comfy. And if our red dot is there at the resolution I'm plotting it, we say, yeah, I'm, I'm very comfortable. So that, that, that is what our statistical test is trying to do. Now, what was the name of that variable? I think it was observed statistic. I'm working live on the server while trying not to break anything. It, this has no impact on the HTML version of the uh, file. So the elements of our statistical test from our last lab and our last meeting, the four essential things are that there's a null hypothesis, that we hypothesize there is no evidence for difference, an alternative hypothesis, uh, last time we didn't belabor it, but there is also a concept of a test statistic. In the example just presented with the red dot moving around, the test statistic was the distance between the experimental result and the data model result, which was a priori specified. And then the fourth part is a rejection region what we called last time, we used a letter of the Greek alphabet to represent where the rejection region was taken. Does anyone recall what that letter was? It was the beginning, not the end. Alpha. Alpha, very good. Um, alpha actually was not a region, it was a, um, a sentinel value, but uh, close enough uh, for concept. So let's suppose we wish to test a hypothesis concerning some parameter theta. In our prior example, theta was the distance between the proportion in the observations and the proportion in the data model. And we have a random sample, y1, y2, all the way up to yn, from which we compute an estimate of the theta, which is called theta hat. So we have a parameter that comes from the population. We may not know the value of that parameter, but we can estimate its value from a sample. And that estimate is usually given the same name and it uses, has this little um, triangular hat on top of it. We'll assume for the uh, sake of this discussion that the estimator has a has an approximately normal, dis normal distribution. And that distribution has mean of theta and a variance uh, sigma squared of theta hat. Suppose theta sub zero is a particular target value of theta. And 
the test we might want to wish for, we might want to perform is theta equal to theta zero versus the alternative that theta is bigger than theta zero. Similar to, but not identical to our red dot in our gray um, histogram. Now the, the cartoon here uh, shows different sampling distributions of the estimator theta hat for different values of theta, including one that happens to center on theta zero. So we may take one sample and when we estimate the parameter theta hat, we get this distribution. Whereas theta zero is our target. So the center of this distribution is quite a long way from theta zero, or we might get this distribution or we might get this distribution, or we might get one which almost centers on top of theta zero. If theta hat is close to theta zero, it's reasonable for us to accept our null hypothesis, although the usual terminology is do not reject. But if theta is a lot bigger than theta zero, it's more likely that the estimator is also going to be a lot bigger. And thus, large values of our estimator, theta hat, which are much larger than theta zero, our target, would favor the rejection of the null hypothesis that theta equals theta zero and favor the acceptance of the alternative hypothesis that theta is larger than theta zero. So using the four elements of a test as a guide, uh, we can concisely say our null hypothesis the estimator is equal to a prescribed value. The alternative is bigger than a prescribed value. The test statistic is the estimate of the parameter. And the rejection region is um, we reject when the estimator is bigger than k for some choice of k. The actual value of the rejection region is determined by our a priori selection of the type one error probability alpha and in choosing k accordingly. So here's our distribution and we're going to pick a type one error probability, usually 5% uh, or 0.5% and we belabored that quite a bit in the last lab and that probability in this particular type of test construction represents the, the area under one of the tails. And so let's say we want the area to be 5%. If it happens to be a normal distribution, we can uh, use a quantile function to find out what, what value k has to be to uh, integrate from k up to infinity to produce an alpha region of 5%. And then k becomes the numerical value at which we reject based on our test statistic. If our null hypothesis is indeed true and our estimator theta hat has approximately a normal distribution and, that, and if that normal distribution happens to have a mean value of theta sub zero and a variance of sigma squared and we desire a type one error probability of alpha, then our numerical value K will normally be uh, set equal to theta zero plus Z sub alpha times sigma of theta hat, where, where sigma theta hat is the standard deviation of our estimate from our sample. Maybe we took six things, we can the standard deviation of those things. And then Z is the Z score uh, for a particular value of alpha that we want. And then theta zero is the mean value we're looking for. So that's the choice for K when we want um, the probability that our Z score is bigger than Z sub alpha, where Z is our standard normal variant, our, our old friend, the Z score. So now our rejection region can be expressed as the rejection region for theta hat is theta hat minus theta sub zero divided by the standard deviation of the estimator. If it's bigger than a z score at a probability of alpha, 
we reject. So now our test becomes a little bit more concise. Null hypothesis, theta equals theta zero, alternative bigger than. Our test statistic is now the z-score of the estimate minus the target divided by the standard deviation of the estimates. Our rejection region occurs when our test statistic z is bigger than z sub alpha for some value of alpha. And remember that we get to choose alpha. So let's look in the, at an example uh, that is attempting, uh, that attempts to leverage these ideas. And we're going back to proportions. So this could be Mendel's um, pea plants for all we care. We have a machine in the factory and, and, and every day it makes, it makes things. Um, and we're, we're making these things and selling these widgets on Amazon. Uh, but if the machine starts to make too many defective items, uh, we get too many customers that actually return the items uh, to Amazon. Amazon being a very difficult taskmaster starts taking money out of our bank account. So we wanna stop the machine when the defect rate gets to be too big. And actually don't laugh at us. This is actually a real, um, a real situation. Most things in the world that are manufactured have some non-zero defect rate. Um, and if, if you can't sell them to a, a community that doesn't know any better, you have to eat the cost. Uh, for instance, medical devices, and I, I know this from a um, colleague in Germany that actually has industrial scale 3D printing and they, and they, and they print these uh, medical devices, they have a very high failure rate. Um, something about like 20% like is pretty typical in a production run. And, and the research that I, that I discussed with him was, uh, it takes a long time to make these things. So it takes them a lot of time, several hours to make a defective device. If they had a way of knowing it was gonna be defective, maybe 25 or 30 minutes into the build, they could terminate it right then and recover that hour and, and, and 40 minutes to go start a new fabrication. And then they recover the materials made out of, they can remelt it and reuse it. So, so defect detection is, is actually a very practical um, engineering problem. So let's go on with our example. We have a machine in a factory. It has to be shut down and maintained when the defect rate gets bigger than 10% on the daily production runs. During a day, a random sample of 100 items from one day of production is collected. And in those 100 items, 15 defective items are detected. And the shop foreman claims the machine has to be stopped and maintained or repaired. So generally the shop foreman is like a god and they're gonna shut it down and repair it. But does the sample evidence support the foreman's assertion? So let's re-examine that question carefully. If we take 100 random samples and we find 15 defects, using our knowledge of probability statistics and Python and all that good shit, um, does that defect count provide sufficient evidence uh, that we are exceeding our 10% defect failure on daily production runs? So let's apply our hypothesis testing process. We'll let Y is going to denote the number of defects. Y is going to be a binomial variable. So it has a value of true or false or zero or one. The probability of one outcome of P and the other outcome one minus P. So think of it as an, as an odd coin, a coin that's, that's a tricky coin that, that doesn't come up heads 50% of the time, but only comes up heads P percent of the time and tails one minus P percent of the time. We will assume that 100 items is a large enough sample so that we can approximate the binomial distribution using a z-score statistic. And you will be introduced to binomial distributions and um, z-scores more rigorously in your statistics class because we're supposed to be doing data science in this class. We don't get to do statistics, which is a good thing. So let's let's propose our null hypothesis. Our null hypothesis is that the defect probability 
is 0.1 or 10%. Our alternative hypothesis is that the defect is bigger than 10%. Our test statistic is going to be our estimated defects p hat minus p sub zero, our null hypothesis proportion, divided by um, the square root of p zero times one minus p zero over n, which is a standard deviation for these binomial flips. Our rejection region is that z is bigger than z alpha for some value of alpha. So let's choose an alpha of 0 0.01. So that's 1%. What is the value for z alpha? Well, now we get to use stuff we've already thought about. We'll import our math um, library. And then we're going to define a function called norm distribution. We've seen norm dist before. And what norm dist will let us do is estimate um, a z score for a particular value of alpha. So if our sample count is 100 and our defect count is 15, our p hat, our estimate of defect rate, is defect count divided by sample count. Um, and so there's, there's, there's no change there from our um, math type setting. Our desire, our, our target defect rate is called p0. It's, it's 10%. And our z test statistic is p hat minus p0 divided by the square root of p0 times 1 minus p0 divided by sample count. So our test statistic is that formula right there. And our z alpha is 2.325. And here we can either find this by trial and error, or we can um, um, get it from our our norm distribution quantile. And so I'll change this number when I run this simulation. And then we go ahead and apply our, our, our reject um, conditional statement. If the value of z test is bigger than the value of z alpha, we reject our null hypothesis. If that's not so, we do not reject our null hypothesis. And then the last part, we can compute some p-values. So let's go ahead and run that. Uh, remember our, our, our case. If our reject rate is bigger than 10%, uh, we need to stop the machines and, and maintenance them. So we run that, and we get do not reject our test statistic. Uh, do not reject our null hypothesis. Our test statistic is 1.667, but our desired rejection value is 2.325. Our attained probability at rejection is um, uh, 0.04 or 4%. If our type one error rate um, was larger, um, we might get a different result. Let's suppose we didn't know what Z alpha was to begin with. So we can make a guess and what we're going to what we're going to look at is the uh, value of the quantile. Let me go ahead and activate the print statement. And so we will ignore all the stuff below that. When we're first trying to find z alpha, we will print the value of quantile. So our quantile is 0.15%, uh, but we're looking for uh, a value of alpha of, um, of, of 5%. So we make this a bigger number. And now we're at a 0.02. We make it bigger still. Now we're at 0 0.001, which is a bit on the uh, small side of area. And we do that, and we're now at a uh, uh, 0.1%. And so for a two tail test, that'd be 0 0.005. Let's go ahead and jack with that a little bit more. I want that to be 0 0.05. I want 5% single tail um, rejection region.
So I need to make my number smaller to get the 5%. Well, that's not bad. That's pretty darn good guess. Uh, bigger makes it smaller. That's close enough. So now my my alpha, my my alpha area is roughly five percent, zero point zero four nine, four point nine percent. And now I now I can continue to evaluate my test. I still get the result of rejection. My test statistic is. Um, oh, and I now get uh, reject our null hypothesis. My test statistic is 1.66. My reject value is 1.64. My type one error probability is 5%. My p-value at rejection is 0.47%. Uh, so I've just gone outside my reject region. And, and so if, if this is the desired um, type one error probability, our foreman is right. Uh, 15 defects in a sample of 100 is sufficient evidence that um, our machine needs repairs. We also can play the same game um, using simulation. We can import the random library. Uh, here's some a map plot library, and we will define a function called sample parts. And in that, we're going to say how many in proportion. And then what we're going to do is we're going to send it the desired defect rate and see what we would expect our defect histogram to look like. So if we have a machine that, produ that is producing defects at 10%, um, here's what a a, a defect rate histogram would look like. Um, let's reduce the bin count a little bit and rerun it. So there's a, uh, a reduced bin count and it's expressed as a density. So if we count 15 samples, that's like our red dot being kind of far away from our, our 10. And the foreman's conjecture that the machine is starting to produce excess defectives is correct. Let me do a bin of five. Oh, that was, that was not useful. I'm trying to get a, a better, I'm trying to cherry pick a picture. So 15 is, is over in here and it's, it's arguably uh, a fair distance away from our most likely result of 10%. So that was an attempt at, at graphical explanation of hypothesis testing. And let me see if I can uh, plot on top of that the red dot. So it looks like I take that. We get to have lots of fun here. We're actually doing real programming. We got to debug something. And I do the plot right before I show the histogram. Okay. So as I recall, our defect rate that we observed in our sample was 15. And let's see what happens. Ah, oh, crap, it still didn't do it right. Well, bummer. Save that for another time. Okay, that, that is all I have for today. If you go on to the, to the uh, class server, there is, a, there is the actual Python notebook I was working in as, as, as we spoke, and there is an HTML file. So this is what it's supposed to look like. It doesn't have the top part quite correct yet, um, but these are the the how it's how it how it was supposed to look 
And I'm now going to hand it off to uh, uh, Farhang, who can walk you through uh, a laboratory to expand on these ideas. And Farhang, as I make you a boss here, we, you don't have to go to the whole time if the lab is a little uh, short, because it is spring break after all. So Not in here. Now the host. <laughs> and um, at least I got to the bottom of why lesson 16 wasn't working. That makes me quite happy. Abby cries. No. <laughs> Let me All right. Share my screen. <laughs> so you should have host control now. Thank you. Um, it is 11.01. If you want to have a five minute You're muted. Break. It's a mask. Can you hear me now? I, I can hear you the whole time. I've got no volume. So, Jordan, you can hear me? Charger is it? I can hear you. Right. Okay, awesome. So, um, if you I want to go interrupt. and have, uh, can anyone else hear Farhang? Yes. Yeah, uh, he's coming yeah. in clear. I'm not picking up any audio on the recording, so that's that's a problem. Maybe that's a blessing for you that you can't hear okay, my well, voice. Yeah, go ahead and start. I will try to figure out what's wrong with my computer. Okay, so guys, if you want to have a short break, and, and uh, we are not, going to... It's not adequate to say because it's an Apple computer, it's broken, although I'm <laughs> quite willing to accept that explanation for the time being. So guys, go and have your break. I will be here. Uh, I'll meet you here in four to five minutes. If you have any questions, let me know. Oh, Kaden, Kaden, you're going to have lots of fun. My computer's been hacked. It's, That's a brilliant my, hack. My only day off was awesome. yesterday, but I'm proud I used it really good. I, I did like all of this class's homework and all of Thermo's homework, so I'm good. But no peanut butter. Nope. I had honey ham and mayo and baby Swiss cheese sandwich. Not a bad choice. It was delicious. And now I've got my gallon of goldfish next to me that I'm enjoying. What is that? Goldfish? Yeah. You don't know what goldfish is? No. Oh, I, okay. I know it as a fish, but I don't know oh, it as something they're, you can eat. Uh, they're little, usually children eat them, but they're really awesome. They, they, they started as soup crackers, but now they come in, their most popular is their cheddar cheese flavor. Some people like their like, they're like crazy flavors, but they suck. I don't <laughs> even tell you that they're good. So you just eat them like a snack? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're really popular with children, but I... I really like them. <laughs> I really like flavored ones, to be quite honest. No, it's not, not bad for your health. It doesn't make you fat. I mean, if you eat pounds upon pounds of them, but normally they come in like little baggies. Oh. I don't really like the flavored ones, but I do like the pretzel ones. Or if you're in my apartment, they don't come in little baggies. They come in gallons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot about those. So, yeah, if you eat those, they'll make you fat. <laughs> I had a friend in school that would just walk around with like one of those big cardboard ones and just eat it all day. Your friend was me. <laughs> that was your friend was me. Uh, yes, sir. I will record the lab on my end. Daniel, you said OG. Are you talking about the cheddar ones? Or are you talking about the real, real OG ones that like they're, they were like flavored like saltines? They just weren't flavored. Hey man, they had flavor. They were flavored like cheese. It's they're freaking good, dude. No, yeah, absolutely. But like people don't realize this. Like goldfish, the, the original goldfish, they were just soup crackers. They were they were they were just salt flavored. Kind of I I've had them. They're decent. I personally think they're the best. Yeah. Okay, I am going to start recording the lab on my end. Record on this computer. Okay. Um, did you all, mm, were you able to download the lab notebook and the CSV files? Yes. Uh, I believe Let so. me try opening them just to make sure. Awesome. Oh yeah, it's open. Awesome. Yeah, they work. 
Okay, cool, cool. So it's 11.05. Shall we begin? Yeah, why not? Really want to. No, okay. So, lab 15, it's a wrap. Unfortunately for you, it's not a wrap like this. Uh, but we are going to work on um, a real world example and apply a lot of the things that we have worked on and talked about and applied over the past, I would say, two weeks um, on this data set and see if um, you have a question or if you are completely comfortable with the content. Before I begin, do you have any questions about what we talked about on Tuesday or last week? I'm not hearing anything, and I assume that you are all good. Let's see. So um, first on top, I'm um, importing the uh, external packages that I will use, NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, Statistics, Skippy Stats, and Seaboard. So, uh, a case of mercury contamination of groundwater is reported. Our field operation team has just returned from the first round of sampling during the initial sampling phase. Three set of 20 samples were extracted from three wells and they are brought to the lab as a file. The units are nanograms per liter for mercury per liter of groundwater. And if you read the lab 15 underline mini df.csv, um, you will have that data set. So if I, if I read the file and I simply print the data frame, I will have something like this. Do you have the same thing on your screens? Yes. Okay. What can you tell me about it? Simply by looking at, at this. It's just a population with a bunch of samples in it. That wasn't quite contradicting the statement. Is it a population or is it a sample? Population. sample. It's a collection of samples. Is Do I have anyone who wants to join Jordan's team on population? Don't let the die, don't let the guy die alone. Join him. Lucky. That's okay, I'll die alone. <laughs> so yes, these are samples. And in this case, if I ask you, what is the population? What would you tell me? The entirety of the groundwater. Which I, is? I would say that we can't know at this point just from looking at these samples like this. Correct, but, but thinking about the problem, we, we are dealing with a mercury contamination of groundwater. Um, what would the population of interest be? Caden, you, you said something about Groundwater, where do we get groundwater from? Aside from uh, the ground, I believe that the population would be the entirety of the groundwater in whatever state that this is reported in. So I am not sure if you have studied this before in high school, so I'm not going to push it, but we get groundwater from aquifers. So for a problem like this, the quality, the water quality in that aquifer is going to be your population. Because if you know that at every location and at every time, what is uh, the status of water quality, how much mercury you have in it, you will have access to your population. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. So I have three sets coming from three wells. And in each set, I have 20 samples. Simply by looking at this data frame, can you give me um, 
an idea or a judgment or an assertion based on which set is doing better and which set is doing worse or it is too hard for you that three looks the worst set yeah, one okay. would look pretty similar but maybe set one's doing a little better okay that is that is an initial assessment let's keep that in mind and we will go on so on step two we are going to explore the data set what were some of the um descriptive functions that we talked about uh, in pandas. Dot describe and dot info. Describe. Okay, so let's look at dot info and see what it is telling us. I I want to volunteer to to come out and explain these few lines for me. Okay. Uh, Hayden. Okay. Yeah. The first line is telling you wh where it's kept. It's in pandas core frame data frame. The range index says we have 20 things in it, ranged from 0 to 19. That's just 20 what? Entries. OK. Rows. Is, guess, Rows, maybe. yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Columns is saying we have three of them. And then it says what type of integer, or like what type of data type the, the columns are in, which in this case is non-null float 64. Mm -hmm. And then it says how much memory it's using and the type. OK. So thank you very much. We know that we are dealing with a data frame that has 20 rows, three columns, and everything in it is float. Deal? Is this enough information? For what? For you to feel comfortable that you know everything about this data set. No. OK. So we move on. And we start getting some descriptive statistics on these sets that we have. First, I am defining my set one equal to the first column of my data frame. And I'm calculating the mean and the median. Simply by looking at this and these two lines, what can you tell me about set one? Since the mean and median are close, we can assume that we don't have any like crazy weird outliers are throwing off our mean. So you you compare them and you realize that they are quite close. And based on that, you pass the judgment that we should not have some crazy outliers. We now cannot... I come out, one moment, please. I come out and I tell you, what if you have crazy outliers but you have two crazy outliers on the right side and two crazy outliers on the left side. So they are tuning down their impact. Is it a possibility? It is a possibility. Okay. Someone else wanted to say something, please go on. Oh, I was gonna say maybe we could assume it has a normal distribution, maybe. Yes. The mean and median being close can be a hint that we might be dealing with um, a normal distribution. It is not a solid observation, but you can use it as a hint. Okay? Is there anything else that you can infer from this information? Okay. We will do the same thing for set two, and we get this. It's even closer, right? So would you say pretty much the exact same things about set two? Yeah. Okay. Yes. If you want to compare set one and set two, what would you say? That they're apart by a certain amount. Yes, and keep in mind, uh, keep in mind the problem that we are dealing with. Keep in mind the goal of this analysis. I'd say it set two has more mercury. Okay, so the severity of of contamination in set two seems to be higher than set one. Okay, moving to set three, we get these numbers. Now. Um, what can you say based on these three code cells? Set three looks really bad. 
it looks worse than set two and set one, but it's mean and median is also quite close. So can you think of one reason why in one of the wells we have a higher contamination level? Closer to the contaminator? It might be closer to the source or depending on when that contamination has happened, it may have moved past point one towards point three. So these are, these are possible situations. We don't know anything about them, so we are not going to um, play them into our analysis. Okay, we are going to look at range, IQR, the five number summary, the variance and the standard deviation for each set. Um, do I have another volunteer other than Caden who wants to help me interpreting this part of results? Okay, I'm going to start calling names then. Uh, Sara, Sara Duello. Yes. Are you there? Yes, I am. I'm right here. Awesome. So um, let's have a look at these results. Tell me what you see. OK, so I can see that. So it reads uh, the, 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 the set one, and then it's giving us information on it. So it starts off by giving us the range, so like the, the minimum value to the maximum value, correct? The difference mm -hmm. between the two. Uh, IQR. Oh, I should know that. Hold on. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Uh, could I have a refresher on the IQR? I'm sorry. IQR is the interquantile range, and it is the difference between the 75th quantile and the 25th quantile. Okay. Okay. I see. So it's like the the range of values for the middle the like like middle the middle middle from mm -hmm. yes yeah. like okay. the average uh, median right mm, no <laughs> median has to do with the location of each data point in their sorted uh, set when we are when we are talking about uh, iqr we are still working with the sorted samples. We care about 75th quantile and 25th quantile. Range, on the other hand, only cares about the smallest value and the maximum value, regardless of what is happening in the middle. So if you have one crazy outlier, uh, for example, everything that you have is between zero and 100, but you have one number that is around 10,000. Range will only care about that high number and the smallest number that you have. So it's more sensitive to loud wires. Okay, Sarah, go on. All right, great. And then next it gives us the count and it tells us that there's 20 samples in, mm -hmm. in uh, set one. Uh, then it goes through the whole list of the, the thing and it gives us the mean, the, the average of it. It gives us the standard deviation Oh God, I know what that is. If you ask me to define it though, I can't put it in words right now. It's all right. So if you want to compare the range and the IQR, what does that tell you? Um, I mean, the IQR is smaller than the range. Yes. So uh, that, that tells you that you have some numbers that are playing a role in your high range that are that can be um, potential candidates for outliers, right? Okay. So for example, your median, looking at the five number summary, you know that your median is at 44, but you have a maximum number of 70. So that maximum number of 70 um, could be an outlier. That just gives you a little hint on that. Okay. 
And we have all already looked at the mean and the median, so we know that they were quite close. And standard deviation. So if you wanted to interpret this information, especially the standard deviation part, what would you tell me? Uh, well, if the standard deviation is 16, that means that like, no, I'm sorry, I got nothing. <laughs> so I, I'm going to tell you something, you tell me whether it's true or false. The majority of my samples fall within a window that goes from 43 minus 16 and 43 plus 16. Okay, okay, so it's... Does that sound true? Yeah, yes, that's, yeah. So again, the statement that I made is kind of based on the assumption that my sample one or my set one is following a normal distribution. That might be true, that might not be true, but that is something that I can keep in mind. Okay? Okay. Thank you very much for playing. Who wants to help me for set two? Uh, I'll try, give it a okay. shot. Awesome. Tell me what you see. Okay, uh, it's gonna it's gonna print the range. It's gonna print the IQR, or well, it's gonna print for set two the range is, and then it's gonna print the range, and uh, kind of the same thing for all the rest. You know, IQR, it'll print IQR. Um, that's about it, right? I mean, that's pretty much it. But here comes the questions. The questions. Uh, your range is twenty, almost twenty eight, right? Yes. If you want to compare it with set one, what can you tell me? With set one? Mm -hmm. With set one, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's lower. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, it, it's your half. range That's what for it is. It's half. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So your range for set two is almost half what you had for set one. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about your IQR? IQR. It's a little bit, it's around half, but it's a little bit more off. Okay. So in, in both of these terms, both in range and in IQR, you are dealing with a lower variability, a lower or a smaller window. Okay. Then we move on and we look at the comparison between the 75th percentile and the maximum. Would you okay. say that you're close? Yes, the max and the max for both of them are both really close. What about for set one? Um, a little bit, oh, well, the max is the same, but the 75% and you know the rest of those are a little bit more off. That is another hint that tells you you might be dealing with an outlier okay. in set one, I mean. So um, what can you tell me about the standard deviation? Uh, it's a lot smaller in that, mm -hmm. you know, the numbers are closer together. Okay. Together, I guess. Thank you very much. Um, who wants to help me with set three? I'll give it a shot. Okay, awesome. What do you see? So I see like a large variance between set three compared to the standard deviation? Uh, you mean here? Yes. Okay. Why did you start from the bottom? Uh, I like working backwards. Okay. <laughs> Keep working. And then, so there's, there's a large, relatively large uh, difference between the max and the min. So you're dealing with a big range. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the inner piece, the, the, the box part. The IQR. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. 
that also has a big range. That is equal to almost 35, while your range is almost 90. So you are having the biggest range of all in your set three, and you're having quite a big difference between your range and IQR. What does that tell you? That there's probably a bunch of outliers. Yes, there, there are some things pulling your range from one of these sides. And then um, what can you tell me based on this standard deviation? Where would you think the majority of your samples fall? To the... Um... I got nothing. If we assume that we're dealing with a normal distribution, we can actually go on and say that the majority of our samples fall somewhere around our mean plus the standard deviation minus the standard deviation. So that will be 67 plus 24, 67 minus 24, something like that. Oh, it'll, it'll have like a big curve mm -hmm. and tapers off. Yes, if, if I cut the curve in, in that window, I will be able to mm -hmm. capture the majority of my samples. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next one is comparing Skunas. Abby, this one's for you. All right, okay. So for set one, we have a skewness of, what is that, negative 0 0.21, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, does the negative skewness mean that it's like left or is it right skew? That's why I'm asking you. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> okay, negative skewness. If I have other answers, please share them in the chat box. Which one of them you think is right skewed? Which one of them you think is left skewed? And which one of them is not skewed? Isn't, isn't it negative skewed when it's like to the left? That's one idea. <laughs> I'm trying to remember from the top of my head. Let's say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with my answer. So with the negative skewness, it's gonna be left skewed, but you can see mm -hmm. that because of zero point, negative 0 0.21, it's slightly negative skewed to the left. And then the same for set two, it's somewhat negatively skewed. And then for set three, we have a slight positive skewness. So it's a little bit to the right. Okay, thank you. So, Something that we know for sure is that one of them is right is skewed, one of them is left is skewed, and one of them is quite symmetrical. Um, it's quite amazing for me that over the past two minutes, none of you have Googled this and come up with the right answer. So do we it. Want to be honest. <laughs> Using Google is completely honest, specifically in this course. We, we have been asking you to use Google and CCMR okay. uh, from <laughs> the it. first session. <laughs> okay, so for the first set, it's going to be rightly skewed, mm -hmm. slightly. And then for the second set, it's almost normal, but it has a little bit of that right skewedness. Mm -hmm. And then for set three, it's going to have a, like it's positive, so it's going to be left skewed slightly. Mm, okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. On the next step, we are using box plots and visually compare the spread of data points in all sets. So if I plot box plots for set one, set two, and set three, it will look like this. And I'm going to ask uh, Asher, are you here? Asher, are you here? 
Okay. Um, Nate, do we have you with us? Nate. I can take this one. Uh, who is that? Uh, Eric. Okay, Eric. Um, all yours. So the was the bot or box plot asking? Um, we are we are plotting box plots for set one, set two, and set three. And as you remember, box plot is a visual representation of the five number summary. Okay. So the box plots are basically showing the data that we're given, right? Mm -hmm. The samples, yes. So since sample three has more data than sample like two and one, it's got a bigger, I, I, I don't know, I can't think of the word right now. I'm so tired, sorry. <laughs> um, it's all right. Uh, they, we know that in each set, we have 20 samples. Okay. So what it is telling us is about the spread of data. The distance between the lower whisker and the higher whisker tells us something. Uh, this or yellow orangish line tells us something about the median. This tells us something about the IQR. So these are the information that we can get from a box plot. Got it. So do you want to go on or shall I ask someone else for the rest of it? Uh, I would say ask someone else. <laughs> okay. Marlene, are you there? Kind of. Okay. So what can you tell me about these three sets by looking at this comparison? Uh, yeah. So these yellow orangish lines are representations of the median. Compare yeah. them and tell me what you see. So um, they have different mean. The second mean, the first mean is the biggest one. The third one is the biggest one. Yeah. The Which one is, is almost, I would say, 65, 60 yeah. And uh, then the second one is the almost... One is 55, no, 57. Yeah, 57, 58. And the first one... You probably say 40, 42. Mm -hmm. And... Um, if you if you want to tell me something about the IQR of these, which which box has a larger IQR? I, the second one. Why? In my eyes, you look big. The IQR is the difference between the beginning of the box and the end of the box. Uh -huh. So box two is quite a small, so I would say that is probably our smallest IQR. Okay. Between one and three, which one do you think is larger? The, the third one. The third one is larger, yes. So three is going to have the biggest IQR. Yeah. And if you want to look at the spread, like the entire length of the plot, which one do you think is the smallest and which one do you think is the largest? The, the largest one is the third one and the smallest one is the second one. Okay, so consistently we are seeing that with sample set two, we are dealing with a smaller range of numbers, a smaller IQR of numbers. And with set three, we are dealing with the largest. Thank you, Marley. So the entire room, if you are suspicious of the presence of outliers, in which set do you think we have a higher chance of having them? Three. I have one answer for three, two answer for three. I would three. say three. Okay. And why three? It has the largest range. 
It has the largest range. What else? Narrative to its IQR. Something else. Um, yes, Brandon said pretty much what Caden said. Yes, that is true. And Jalissa said largest is spread. Also correct. If you look at the length of these tiny lines, that is also something that can give you a hint. So if you have a small uh, whiskers, you're, you're probably dealing with um, a very compact set and less chance of observing an outlier. But with these, you will definitely be more cautious about them. Okay. We're going to use histograms and visually compare the distribution of data points in all sets. Set one, I'm plotting it with six bins and with a red color. What kind of distribution do you see here? I mean, I don't know. It kind of doesn't, I mean, it's supposed to look normal, I guess, but like kind of doesn't. That's Could like a Lego piece that has been up. broken. Could you change the bins maybe to see how it's distributed? It's kind of what number do you want? Uh, let's try 10. I guess I have to run a few things, but that's all right. Mm. Do you like it better? Let's change it to five. <laughs> the guy on the God's chair knew something when he set that number equal to six. But oh. anyway, five. Go ahead, Caden. I'm liking one. One looks good to me. Dude. That's not going to be good. You Perfect. happy now? Perfection. <laughs> no, seriously, look, look at it with six or five bands and tell me what kind of distribution you see here. What, what is this plot telling you? It's telling me it's pretty even across the board. Mm -hmm. So it is basically telling you that is starting from somewhere around 10 until 45, you have the same frequency of samples. You have three samples in each bin, and then you have four samples between 40 to 50, and then you have two samples between 50 to 60, and you have five samples above 60, right? Does it look like a commonly known distribution that you have dealt with before? Yes, no, maybe. Are you like referring to the skewness or like? I mean, does it look like a normal distribution? Does it look like a gumball distribution or something like that? Um, no, it does not. That's an answer, thank you. Travis says a somewhat even histogram. That is correct. Okay, let's move on. Set two. Judging by the looks on your face, you are not a big fan of this one either. Tough crowd to please. I, I think he's cute. I like him. See? Be accepting of distributions that are different from the celebrity distributions that you commonly deal with. Yeah, no, not I'm all distributions him. are Leo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt's out there. Sometimes you have to deal with Jared Leto. So, any comments on this one? It's pretty erratic, is what I'd say. Erratic? as in you cannot see a clear pattern uh, between bins and frequency. Am I right? You are right. Okay. What about this one? I love him. 
He looks more <laughs> normal than the rest, except we're just going to ignore Bin too. Okay. Do you, do you have any kind of um, inference or initial assessment by comparing these three? The red, the blue, and the yellow. Red seems to be the most um, stable at the frequency of three, uh, where blue is the most erratic, with um, yellow kind of being the middle ground. Okay. And uh, the yellow one looks kind of like this. Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so let's plot them together on the same plot. Uh, do you feel better now? Yeah. Yeah, so tell me what, what can you infer from this? They look a lot more normal. They look normal. Interesting. I oh, don't know. That looks odd to me. Looks odd. Interesting. Any other comments? They look more alike, I guess. Yeah. Set two has the highest extreme. That is correct. Any other comments? Any other ideas? Okay, now we are going to add KDE to our histograms and then compare the continuous shape of distributions in all sets. What do you think now? Much better. See, when you get to know ugly people, they may have interesting things about them. Okay. Now, what can you tell me about the three distributions? Are they normal? Are they log normal? Are they gumball, gamma, or something that you have never seen before? I think that normal has the highest peak. So I am, I'm getting normal from Caden. Um, someone else was saying something about a peak. Yeah, blue has the highest like peak that, mm -hmm. out of the three. Which I believe uh, someone said it before. I, I can't remember the name. So Dr. Cleveland is saying something in the chat box, but uh, it, it is coming privately to me. So I'm receiving from the God himself. Uh, he says, probably all gamma. I think gamma. See, trust in God. Um, if you were to say true or false to, to my next statement, what would you say? These yeah. three are, <laughs> these three are all coming from the same distribution. No, I'd say false. I'd say true, depending on your range. No okay. Any other answers? Did actually, I might change mine. Sorry, because uh, there's only 20 samples, so it actually might true pr prove close enough. So now I have two true, three true, do you repeat that? The three sets are all coming from the same distribution. True or false? Come on, give an answer. It, it's a 50-50 chance. Hold on. I'm writing in the, in the chat because I want to explain it. <laughs> so true, true, true. I have one false from Brandon. Dr. Cleveland is asking another question. So how can you test that assertion? I am getting some more truths. So Brandon is the only one on the false team. Are you going to leave him there? So in, in the entire room, I have one brave Brandon who says false. And some of you saying true and the rest of you playing with your phones and not even paying attention to me 
Okay. So Caden is answering Dr. Cleveland's question and say hypothesis testing. Okay. So we are going to have a look at these sets and see what we can infer and understand about the underlying distributions. We are going to use Green-Gorton plotting position formula and draw a quantile plot for each set. Do you remember Green-Gorton plotting position formula? No, not really. Oh my God. Do you remember plotting position formulas? Yeah. Yes. What were they? Buttons on the thing. Do I have someone who wants to tell me what a plotting position formula is? Isn't it when like we have to sort the data in order and then like you plot it based on like frequency, I guess? Thank you, Abby. Oh my God, you're gonna shoot yourself? <laughs> <laughs> so we sort our samples and then we use a specific equation, in this case, the Gringorton equation to plot those samples on an empirical CDF or cumulative distribution function. So first I will define my Gringorton underlying PP function. And then I'm converting my set one, set two, set three to NumPy arrays. And then I'm applying the Green-Gorton underlying PP function on each one of them. And then I just plot them as a scatter plots. Why am I plotting them as a scatter plots? Why not line plots? Because we because have the sample, sample, not a model of the population. Thank you. That was the most beautiful moment in this entire session. Yes because we are dealing with samples and not the population. Plotting it will give me this. What do you see here? That increase that's telling us absolutely nothing. <laughs> uh, I think it is telling us a few things. For example, If you were to give me the value associated with 80% exceedance probability from set one, set two, and set three, which one would be higher? Yellow. Okay. How much will that yellow be? Um... So let's say I'm, I'm looking at this line here. 90-ish. Yes. What about my set two? About 50, 55, 60. In my yeah. eyes, that is close to 60 and a little above. Yeah. <laughs> and this one? Set one? 55-ish. Yeah. Okay. So if I look at a plot like this and I say consistently my set three is higher than my set one, am I right or am I wrong? You are correct. Okay. If I look at this plot and I say that consistently my set two is greater than my set one, am I right or am I wrong? Uh, correct. Am I? Wait, which one's set, set one again? Set one. If red. I say that set, set two is blue, set one is red, and set three is yellow. If I set that if I say that my set two is consistently greater than my set one, blue is consistently greater than red. Am I right or am I wrong? Yes, you're right. Yeah, you're right. What about this point? Uh, slightly above, maybe, or maybe at the same, I don't know. So except for that last 
highest point in the two sets, I can say, I can make that a statement. But that point in, in around 65, they seem to be at the same point. Okay. So let's answer Dr. Cleveland's question in the chat box. If a new observation, if someone just walks to the office and tells them they have one new sample, and that sample has a value of 100, do you think it will most likely belong to set three, set two, or set one? Set three. Because set three is the one that's gotten to that point. And how did you make that call? By using the graph. Okay. So it's not completely useless. <laughs> it's not absolutely nothing. Got it. Okay, cool, cool. Now we can actually go on and look at a few data models like normal, gumball, and gamma and see which one fits each set better. So do you remember the norm dist function that we used before? Please say yes, please say yes, please say yes. 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 Okay. Yes. But do you? Yes. Okay. So I defined a norm dist function for the normal distribution data model. And then I apply it for my set one and I plot it. What do you think about this fit? It's meh. Which parts of it you like, which parts of it you don't? The middle looks great. The end, well, not the very end, but like the middle end around 0.75, it's kind of not that great. And towards the beginning, not that great. Okay. Um, let's look at set two with normal distribution. Yeah, it looks better, set towards the end. I can live with that. I mean, so, depending on what I'm doing. Again, this part is giving us a little bit of a trouble, but here it's not that bad, right? What about set three? That looks nice. That looks quite good. Again, maybe in the middle, we are not doing as great, but in the higher end, we are, we are way better than the others. So we have looked at normal distribution data model for set one, set two, and set three. Let us move on to Gumbel. Again, I first defined the function for Gumbel distribution data model. I applied for my set one and I get this lovely fit. I hate it. You have every right to. So Oof. Um, set two. Somehow worse. Set three. Like a modern art. Is a so currently comparing normal and uh, gumball for set one, which one is your winner? Normal. For set normal. two, which one is your winner? Normal. normal. For set three, which one is your winner? Normal. normal. Do I have anyone who thinks otherwise? Okay, let's move to gamma again. We will first define the function for gamma distribution data model, and then we apply it on our set one and we get this. Yeah, that's not so bad. Compare this with the normal distribution data model for set one and tell me which one you like better. They're honestly pretty close, but yeah, I applied for gamma. That's one vote from Caden, the rest of you. Come out and answer the question. I don't know, man. Normal's looking a little better, I feel. I'm on your team, actually. Visually ass assessing it, I think uh, normal is doing better for the middle samples. And both of them are, are having some issues in this area. I think I was looking at the wrong graph. I'll go to normal. OK. So the number of you actually playing the game with me is, is going down. I have only Sean and Caden answering my questions now. I'm not happy. I'm happy that they're with me. I'm not happy that the rest of you have left. So Harper, 
Travis, Brandon, thank you. Aaron, yeah. Okay. So for set two, this is gamma. Do you think gamma is better? I don't think it's better. I think it's not bad though. So between gamma and normal, which one do you like better? I'm still rooting on normal. All right. I don't like gamma. Okay. So what about set three? I feel this is the one where gamma kind of pulls ahead a little bit. Uh. So for set three, let, let's have a vote. For set three, do you like normal better or gamma better? They're so close. I'm Aaron. looking at them both. I think gamma looks to be just like marginally better. Mm -hmm. They are okay. very, very close, though. Looking at them side by side, I'm having to flip through multiple times to see. But I think Gamma pulls ahead just slightly. Well, let me, Thank you let very me much. In my thinking process this way. They're so close that if I'm writing a paper on this, I don't want to explain why all my data sets are normal except for data set three. They're close enough to save me a page to explain why I chose Gamma for set three. Okay. <laughs> That's one way of looking at it. But let me let me give you this. There is no way that you are going to be able to publish a paper on 20 samples. So, <laughs> but that was a good point. Now, um, in my version from visual assessment, normal distribution for set one and set two and gamma distribution for set three provided better fits. I think that was quite along what we voted on. Run appropriate hypothesis tests and decide whether each set of samples has a normal distribution or not. What kind of test do I need to answer this question? A parameterized test. Um, I think you're or, referring to a parametric test, but yeah. read the question again. The Shapiro-Wilk test, right? The Shapiro-Wilk test is a what test? Normality test. Normality. normality test, yes. So we need normality tests. A repetitive question. A normality test is applied on one set of numbers, two sets of numbers, multiple sets of numbers. One, just one. I have one from Caden. One from Jalissa, one from Harper. Okay, more ones are coming. Do I have anyone who, who thinks different? Okay, we are going to use the shapiro wallach normality test for set one and the answer is a p-value of 0 0.451. So when I compare it to my significance level of 0 0.05, I can say that set one is probably normally distributed, right? OK. What about set two? We get a p-value of 0 0.246, and we say, probably normally distributed because it is greater than 0 0.05. For set three, we get 0 0.858. And again, we say probably normally distributed. So compare these test results and tell me what they mean to you. Well, if I remember the higher p-value means like more normal sort of so i guess set three is the most normal set two is the least normal but they're all they're all probably normal 
so I I would probably say what you mean is that there is a higher probability that your sample set three belongs to a normal distribution. Yeah. And there is a lower probability that your set two belongs to a normal distribution. So is this result and is this conclusion um, consistent with our visual assessments? Yeah, except that a lot of people wanted to say set three was gamma. So according to this, your set three is even more consistent with a normal distribution that your set one and set two. Is that what you also observed? That's what I said. I mean, no. I, I was normal. No, even you said that set three looks kind of similar between normal and gamma, but it's not as big of a difference. So I, I, I will not bother myself with it. But the difference we saw for like set two or set one was more clear, wasn't it? Yeah. But do I see the same thing here, judging the p-values? It is not consistent because simply looking at the p-values, we say that, okay, it seems that set three is the one that looks the closest to a normal distribution. Set one is in the middle and set two is the lowest. Where do you think this inconsistency is coming from? Or at least, can you think of a few factors that are causing this? Say it, Sean. I thought I had it, then I didn't. Oh, wait. Is it because the distribution has like a large range, but it has like weighted ranges, maybe? I don't know if I'm explaining I, right. I, I'm not sure that I'm understanding you. Uh, yeah, forget it. I, I don't think I understand it either. So Dr. Cleveland gave us a hint in the chat box and he says, normal distribution is a particular case of gamma distribution. So you're all right. But do you think that a small sample size can be a contributing factor? True or false? Sample size is a contributing factor. Two yeses in the chat box. Yes. Three, four. Definitely. Okay. So keep that in mind. We're going to address that. But we are asked to run appropriate hypothesis tests and decide whether the three sets are, the Caden word, significantly different or not. What kind of test do you think we should use? Parametric or non-parametric? It doesn't really matter here because parametric mm -hmm. is for normal stuff, but non-parametric works on all of them. And why are we allowed to use parametric tests now? Because we just checked if it was normal. Very good. Okay, so we we did check the normality with the Shapiro-Wilk test, and according to the results, they are all probably normally distributed. So we are allowed to use um, parametric tests as well. Let's use the student's t-test question. Student's t-test should be applied on one set of numbers, two sets of numbers, three sets of numbers, more sets of numbers. Two. I have one answer for two, two answers for two, three answers for two. Okay. So um, we all agree on that. Yes, the student's t-test is being applied on two sets here. And when I run the test, I get a p-value of 0 0.004, which is smaller or larger than my threshold. It's 
Smaller. Smaller, which means that they are probably from different distributions. So if we compared set one and set two, we got a p-value smaller than our significance level. And hence, we said that they probably belong to different distributions. Let's do the same thing for set one and set three. This time we get a p-value that's even smaller, 0 0.001. And again, we say that probably set one and set three also belong to different distributions. And then we run it for set two and set three, and we get a p-value of 0 0.08, which is slightly bigger than our significance level. So we do not have enough evidence to reject the null and we just say that they probably belong to the same distribution. So, so far in our analysis, who was right? The brave Brandon or the rest of you? What was Brandon's answer again? He's when I ask the three distributions, be, the three sets belong to the same distribution. Brandon was the only one who said false, and the rest of you said true. Now, do you think he was right, or do you think you are still right? I'm giving you a chance to jump trains. I guess I'll jump ship and say that Brandon won. Okay. Now Brandon is attracting more followers while Caden just gave me a firm no. He's waiting for something to come and support his theory. So I'm going to ask for your votes again. The three sets belong to the same distribution. False or true? Just type it in the chat box. Now, does this mean that all three sets have to? So if mm -hmm. two sets and one don't. Even um, if one of them is different, your answer to okay. my question should be false. So Caden, you did, you did switch. Awesome. I thought I switched at the very end because I remembered that we only had 20 data points. Oh, okay. So now there is not one in this room that believes that the three distributions are, the three sets are from the same distribution. Am I right? All of you think that they are different. Interesting. And you're passing that judgment based on 20 sample points? I still think that they're from the same distribution, but I don't have numbers to support me, so I'm going to say they're different. Okay. That I, is, I, that I is a... To question our data points. Yeah, I, 20 is not enough, of course. But you are willing to pass a judgment based on, on what you have. You didn't give me the option to abstain my vote. You told me to vote. So if I have to vote, then I'm going to say what my data says. Very good. Yes, that is a good place to stand. You understand the need for more data points, but based on what you have and what we've done so far, you are saying that they belong to different distributions. Okay. Since almost all of you, let me ask you this. How many of you think that we need more samples? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So th if this was your company and if this project was brought to you at this point, would you send your operation teams out there to gather more samples? Yes. Yep. They have to earn their pay somehow. Okay. So <laughs> fair point. Our field operation team install the monitoring device on each well that can take samples and record the concentration of mercury around 28 times per hour. After a month, the monitoring log is brought to the lab. Now, in the lab 15 underlying max CDF, you will have a data frame that looks like this. 
since I believe Caden helped me the first time with the mini DF, I'm going to ask him again. What can you tell me about this data frame now? There are 18,862 rows and three columns or three sets again. Are you happy? I'm happy. Okay, so instead of 20 samples from each well, now we have 18,861 or basically 62. Um, do you think this is big enough? Will you feel more comfortable passing a judgment based on this data set? Absolutely. I would feel more confident. Yes. More comfortable okay. than 20. <laughs> yes, exactly. So let us move on. Let's explore the data set. Um, and this time we're going to be a little faster. So let me ask Kellen, are you here with me? Yes, I'm here. Can you tell me what you see here? Yeah, give me a second. Yeah. I see that uh, it's displaying the information within the data. Um, there's roughly 19,000 entries. Uh-huh. Um, How many columns? Three, or mm -hmm. yeah. And what is the type of what you have in this data frame? Uh, float, yes. 64. Yeah, okay. thank you very much. Yeah, no so, problem. On the next step, we are going to use descriptive statistics and get an estimate of the center of the distribution for each set. So we are calculating the mean and the median. Let me ask John G. Are you here? Yes? No? Oh, okay. It's all right. It's all right. So next one, John Smith, are you here? No. Um, Jordan, you are here. So uh, tell me what you see and what can you tell me about the sets based on mean and median? So uh, I guess between all the sets or like what sets do you want me to compare? Um, let's say that I have asked you to check the mean and median of the three sets and you have uh, run this code and uh, because you've been in the data science class with the coolest group that you could. And now you want to tell me what you see as the result. Give me a uh, so like, I guess between set one and set two, uh, there's a, I guess there's not really a big difference, but there is a difference, uh, I, I guess with the mean and the median is pretty much the same exact difference between set and one, two. But if you're comparing all of them, they're pretty closely, I guess, matched, except the mean for set three is quite far from the mean of set one. Okay, so looking at each set, we are seeing that, for example, in set one, the mean and median are very close. Mm -hmm. For set two, the mean and median are very close. But for set three, we are having a difference of almost six units between the yes. mean and the median. So that is something that we can see. And again, we are seeing that the uh, central location for set two is larger than set one, and for set three is larger than set two. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Now, let us move on and look at other descriptive statistics. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Harper. I know you're there. Yes. Okay, so tell <clears throat> me what you see for set one, and then I will scroll down to set two and set three. Um, so for set one, range is 122. IQR is 20, which that's a pretty large difference between those two. So we probably got some outliers in there. Mm -hmm. um, 
then you know five number summary you count as eighteen thousand whatever mean of fifty. Um, you're you're missing a line. Your mean is minus nine point five. Ah, uh, that's an interesting number. Very for, interesting uh, number. Is it even possible for our case? Mm -hmm. What does that tell you? Um, so that looks like some sort of equipment uh, malfunction. Beautiful, yes. Um, and then I guess depending on the distribution, we'd be able to see if that's either for that one count or if everything is downshifted. That's something uh, that we need to consider, yes. Is there anything else about set one that gets your attention? Uh, the max is 112, which is uh, significantly larger than the mean and significantly larger than the 75th percentile. Which again uh, gives you a hint about presence of outliers. Yes. Okay, let's move on to set two. What do you see here? Um, set two looks a lot more normal. The range is twice the size of the IQR, but uh, yeah, 15 to 30 isn't that huge of a jump. So I'm, I'm going to ask you to pause and I'm going to give you the warning that I've repeated a few times. These words have certain meanings in, in, in this field. So when you say it looks more normal, what do you mean? Oh, whoops. Yeah, I forgot <laughs> words mean things. <laughs> yeah. So uh, keep, it looks keep more not crazy like set one. Uh, you're the dealing with a way smaller range and your range and IQR is way more similar than set one. Mm -hmm. Go on. Um, the min is pretty close to the 25th percentile. Max isn't too much higher than the 75th percentile. So probably nothing too crazy with outliers. Very good. And set three? Uh, set three is a huge range. Um, yeah, minimum is greatly below the 25th and uh, so that might be an outlier and the maximum is very much above the 75th percentile so um, that could be an outlier. Okay awesome thank you very much. Now let me move to the next step where we are comparing Schooness. Abby come back to the stage and Tell us what you see. Uh, so for uh, set one, uh, you have a really small skewness. So we can assume there's like a normal distribution. And for set two, you could uh, see that the skewness has a lower number. So you can assume it's a, a normal, almost normal distribution. And for set three, you could see that the skewness is 1.17. So you could see that it's uh, negatively skewed. Okay, thank you very much. Looking at the box plots, um, who wants to who wants to talk about this graph? I can talk about it. Okay, awesome. I finally found this. Fix my mic microphone. Awesome, thank you. So, if you want to compare the medians, what can you tell me? Uh, I think they're all about just about the same, but uh, set three has a much larger range. Exactly. Yes. And so we're dealing with medians around fifty-five ish in three of them, but we are dealing with much larger IQR and much larger um, spread in set three in comparison to set two and even to set one. Yes. Okay. Um, 
Jordan, you said they are between 40 and yes, yes. Yeah, you, you're talking about the medians. Yeah, they are all in this range. So thank you, Brandon. Let us move on and look at histograms and visually compare the distribution of data points in all set. Do you remember the ugly uh, distributions that you were just hating upon and Caden was the only one who liked them? Yes, now look yes. at them. Now I see you all smiling and you like them, see? I'll be careful who you call ugly in high school, right? Exactly, Ooh. yes. <laughs> so what do you think about set one? Look familiar? That's a yes. Why does it look familiar? What do you think about it? Because that's a normal looking distribution. That looks like a bell, and that looks like a normal distribution, okay? Bell-shaped, yes, normal list, okay. Let us go to set two. Hmm, what do we have here? The wall. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What else? John Snow will probably be here. Uh, Abby says almost uniform. Yes. Um, what do you think about this distribution? It seems to be a lot closer than data set one. So would you say that in, in set two's distribution, there is an almost equal chance of having a number in the entire range? Yes. Yes. Okay. As long as it looks like it's below 300 or 350, maybe. Yeah. Yes, I agree with you. Okay. Let's move to set three. Ta da. What do you think about this one? Looks normal, but it's way skewed. Looks normal, but skewed, which means. Gamma, 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 yeah. What you described is basically a gamma distribution. So Dr. Cleveland asked a question and said, what's the chance of observing a value less than 30 from set two? Looks like zero. Yeah, okay. Cool, cool, yes. I think that that's what he wanted you to pay attention to. Okay, so we looked at uh, histograms and we said, looks like a normal distribution, looks like a uniform distribution, looks like a gamma distribution. Now, if I plot them all together, do you think this is a better and more uh, descriptive plot than the other three? By virtue of having more samples, yes. Yes, but do you like to look at the three individual plots or look at this? Oh, I thought we were talking about the first set. Never mind. No, I think that wasn't also a valid comparison. Now that we have more samples, we have uh, a better representation of the curve. But now that we are plotting them on top of each other like this, um, I we, we basically can't see anything about sets one anymore. But how about this one? This is a beauty. You're looking at three of them on top of each other and you can clearly distinguish between them. So do you see the difference between the normal, the gamma and the uniform distributions that we talked about? Yes. So let me do a little Google search. Uh, Seaborn disk plot opacity. How do I, I don't want to remove it. This might be a better one. I 
think the alpha thing might be helpful. Let's give that a try. Oh, got an unexpected keyword argument not working. So Dr. Cleveland, what you have put in the chat box, is it something that I should uh, also apply in Python? Because I, I think it works a little different here. So this one will not do what we want. Or alpha, it should have alpha. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give it 30 more seconds and then give up. It works on hist plot, so. Oh, it's probably the older version. So anyways, I know that there is, there are supposed to be ways that you can change the transparency and everything, but yes. We did it. It looks a little ugly because maybe I haven't read the new data. Set one, set two, set three. Okay, so it worked. So for the um, when you're using the plot hist function on pandas, if you use the alpha equals 0 0.5, you can actually reduce um, and make it more, you can make your bars more transparent. If I go with 75, it will be more solid. If I go with 25, it will be even more transparent. But um, I, I kind of like Seaborn a lot. So that's another tool that you can use. And uh, I, I think it gives you better colors, better plots, but that's really a matter of your opinion. So let me have a look at the time. Okay, we're still good. Okay, again, we are going to use the Green-Gorton plotting position formula and draw a quantile plot for each set. Do you remember Green-Gorton Green -Gorton plotting position formula? Guys. Yoo-hoo. Thank you, Brandon. So, um, Abby, where are you? Um, right. Do you remember Green Gorton plotting position formula? You sort, you sort your data and like, it graphs are like the, the frequency of it. Thank you. We, we sort the samples and we, then we apply the specific equation, in this case, Green-Gorton, and we can plot an empirical CDF. Now, look at this. 
What is the first big difference that comes to your eyes when you compare this uh, CDF with the ones that we had before? The, the space between plots is almost zero, if not Why? zero, because we Why have more data samples. Exactly. We have so many sample points that it actually looks like a line in the more crowded areas. You, you know that it's a scatter plot because first of all, you're plotting it as a scatter plot. And second of all, you can see some spaces between the points in the extreme ends. But that is one of the benefits of having many sample points. You, you actually get to see everything in a smoother format. Now, let's do the same thing. Fit a normal gumball and gamma distribution. Normal distribution on set one. How do you feel about this fit? Caden, are you with us? It's all right. So. It looks beautiful, I agree. Uh, do you think it is a good fit? Yes. That's a very good fit. Yeah, that, that probably is literally a perfect fit. But set two, what do you feel about this? Not so great. Not so great, not the best. Before I move on, what would be a perfect fit for this? What kind of curve? As linear. linear. Come again? Linear. Yes, basically a straight line that connects all these points would be the perfect fit. So that was set two and normal distribution. Set three and normal distribution. How do you like it? They got it's spirit. Almost. So you are doing very well on these extreme high points. You're doing a little off on this areas. It's not the best, but it's not bad, is it? They could easily live with it. Now, let's go for the Gumbel distribution data model. Set one, how do you like it? No, yeah, especially when you see the perfect fit of normal on this, there will be nothing that can compete. Uh, set two. <laughs> and set three. Ugly and crazy, yes. So let's go and check out gamma. Interesting, this is gamma on set one. How do you like it? I like it. You like it. Do you like this for set one or normal for set one? Uh, hmm. Would you call this a perfect fit? Yeah. Me too. It, it, it is very good. Like every point from the maximum to the minimum is captured very well. It's like I put the points there and then I draw the line. It, it's very good. What about set two? It's okay. No. It's not it's as better good. than the other two, right? Yes. It's not perfect, but it's better than the other two. And set three. Oh, we have a wonderful three. I agree. Now, we are going to run appropriate hypothesis tests and decide whether each set of samples has a normal distribution or not. What kind of test do I need for this? No trick question. The Shapiro Wilk normality test. Exactly. Any normality test would do. In this case, we're using the Shapiro Wilk. 
I run it for set one, I get a p-value of 0 0.757, which means that this is probably normally distributed. I run it for set two. Do you guys remember the p-value that we got previously for set two? When it, when it had 20 samples or? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Was that like zero to something? Exactly. Dr. Cleveland remembers the same thing. And I also remember the same thing. So in that case, it was 0 0.2 and it was above the significance level. And we said that it probably belongs to a normally distributed um, population. But look at this. Now we are getting a p-value of zero, which means it is not normally distributed at all. And actually looking at those plots, we know that it, it is not normally distributed. Where is that difference coming from? Why initially, previously, we thought that it is probably normally distributed, and now we are almost sure that it's not? Sample size? Exactly. That is why we do not talk, judge, or publish based on 20 sample points. Because you can easily be wrong and you wouldn't even know. Okay, now, um, if we run the test for uh, set three, what do you expect to see? Normal or not normal? Not normal. And that's what we get. A p-value of zero means that set three is also not normal. So based on our normality test, we know that set one was probably normally distributed and set two and three are probably not normally distributed. Now, set uh, step 25, we are going to run appropriate hypothesis tests and decide whether the three sets are significantly different or not. And what do you expect to see? Do you, now do you think they are significantly different or not? Yes. They are different, yes, as the brave Brandon said from very early on. So we, we basically compare all of them together and we realize that they probably belong to different distributions. Do I have any questions? Not for me. Do you feel comfortable with what we did today? because we basically touched on everything that we have learned in the past two weeks. I feel comfortable. However, uh, I you know, need to sit down and think about it more. <laughs> That's a good thing. Okay, as your exercise, I've asked normality, who cares? Why should we check data for normality? And I actually answered this question multiple times on Tuesday and today. And that's a wrap. Thank you very much for paying attention to me. Um, sorry that I didn't let you go earlier than usual. Um, I didn't have a very good uh, participation rate today. Uh, I had only 31 of you here with me. Thank you very much to those of you who answered the questions and played the game and voted. And I am going to pass the host back to Dr. Cleveland. Dr. Cleveland, do you, do you have your microphone or you can't talk? Since you're still typing, I believe that your microphone is not working. Try that again. I don't know if awesome. you can hear me. Yes, we can. I can't hear you, but I guess that's half the battle. So um, let me turn on my video for the last few minutes. Uh, thank you all very much. Actually, today worked out to be a, a really special day because you got to see us fix broken stuff. And you don't get to see that very often because most people don't do live presentations with broken stuff. Um, and we got to see how to assess sameness and differenceness. And we got to see the impact that sample size can have on decision making and why we use these somewhat complicated 
to put our brain around tests to help us defend those decisions. Uh, there's a question in the chat box that says, will we have a review session for exam two? Certainly, we'll have it a week after the exam's over. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and um, Marlene, if your brain hurts now, that, that's good. It, it picked the right time to hurt. Um, and it'll, it'll get better once tomorrow starts and you have your spring break day. Um, uh, Julissa, yeah, we'll have a review. Uh, exam two is actually going to, it, Actually, I'm glad you brought that up. It's going to be moved to the, it's been moved to the following week. I've already updated the, um, the syllabus, but the, the notebook, I haven't actually rendered the HTML syllabus. It's getting moved um, from whatever it was. I think it'll be on the 30th in this class. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, you don't need to thank me. It was other people who are at a higher pay grade made that decision. So I, I just follow them. Um, no, not to April 1st, because we never, you never want to take an exam on April Fool's Day, ever. But it's um, the uh, 30th. And so actually, let me pull that up. I'm going to take just a few minutes of your time and let me get my screen sharing on. Hopefully I have nothing embarrassing. Looks like this is a clean screen. And while uh, Farang was uh, lecturing, I was trying to rebuild our uh, server. And syllabus. So exam two is on March 30th. The contents of exam two, um, it says lessons to 10 through 16. So pretty much everything since exam one, we, we probably will not have any meaningful questions on exam two related to interval estimates. They're very important, um, but there will not have been enough time from their presentation to be able to uh, ask a very meaningful question. Uh, for what it's worth, as of now, you actually know how to do interval estimates, although we haven't shown you, because interval estimates and hypothesis testing and uh, alpha values, they're all different ways of expressing the same thing. On Tuesday, we're going to look at another type of comparison testing called A-B testing, which is a stupid name for um, what we've been doing, but but it's it's there and needs to be covered. And then we'll do interval estimates and then we'll do exam two. So the contents of exam two will be randomness, descriptive statistics, that'll be easy. Uh, distributions, remember we introduced them as simply data models. So these are just functions. Uh, probability estimation modeling, fitting those functions to observations and making decisions. And then what we've been talking about all week, hypothesis testing. So we'll, we'll have a review. Let's see, today, tomorrow's the 19th. We have another weekend before the exam. So we'll have a review next weekend for exam two. All right. Please take tomorrow off if you can. It's your spring break. You know, it used to be a week for you to go wild and crazy. And now you gotta, now you gotta compress that all into a 24 hour period. So I think the weather is supposed to be nice. If you're in Lubbock tomorrow, get out and enjoy the day um, or Saturday, you know, pick which day you're gonna, you're gonna enjoy, but, but take a day off, you need it. And we will see you on Tuesday in class, Monday office hours for me are at 10 o'clock. And office hours for Farang, I think he's at nine. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, use the office hours if there are homework or lab questions that you have to ask. And have a great weekend. Oh, so Daniel's going fossil hunting. Good job. I hope you uh, find some um, big bones. 
And uh, Abby's brain never rests. And anyway, have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care, guys. Be safe.